Hello, everyone. Welcome to Live Law. I am Manu Sebastian, the managing editor of Live Law. As we are about to celebrate the 75th Republic Day, several questions rise in our minds about the state of our constitution, fundamental rights, and judiciary. This is a moment which calls for deep introspection. So in this backdrop, we are having a discussion with a very eminent Supreme Court lawyer, senior advocate Dushin Dave, who was a former president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. Mr. Dave has always stood for the rights of marginalized and oppressed and has never minced his words in vocalizing his criticism of the judiciary wherever it is required. So we are very privileged to have Mr. Dave with us. I'm sure this is going to be a very enlightening discussion. So thank you so much, sir. Welcome to our interview. Good evening. Good evening. Thank, thank you very you. much for having me. Okay. Sir, so recently, a sitting Supreme Court judge made a very significant observation. Justice A.S. Oak, while speaking in a public seminar, he said that the faith of the common man in judiciary has eroded considerably. And it is very rare for a sitting Supreme Court judge to make such a very honest comment and a very introspective comment as also, if I would say so. So what do you think uh, has prompted a sitting Supreme Court judge to make such a public comment? First and foremost, you must uh, understand that Justice Abhay Oak is one of the finest justices of the Supreme Court today. He is not only very competent and able, but he is fiercely independent. And he is one of those who genuinely wants to do justice. There is no hypocrisy about him. He is a matter of fact judge. It doesn't matter who is the counsel who appears before him, nor does it matter who the litigant before him. He only looks at the law and decides. So he is an exceptional judge. And coming from him, uh, these statements, I'm not surprised because he's one of those who can really speak his mind. And uh, he has spoken it because perhaps he realized that unless we start talking about it, there is no way we can you know, improve the situation which is prevailing in the judiciary in the country. The administration of justice is indeed uh, has, has virtually failed. Uh, I mean, I, and I have been saying so for a long, long time, uh, not just now. For last almost 10 years, I have been publicly saying that judicial system has failed. It's been hijacked by the rich and the powerful and the needy are not getting justice. Uh, so I think I strongly uh, would, uh, you know, support what Justice Oak has said with utmost uh, and greatest respects to him. And uh, I'm so happy and delighted that he has uh, started a debate. And I hope that Chief Justice Chandrachud and his other colleagues, as also every judge in the country and every lawyer, will now you know, take this debate forward uh, to see that something really takes place, a change takes place. Because after all, after all, we all love judiciary. We all, but we all must be mindful of the fact that we are here to cater to somebody uh, who wants justice. The real stakeholder is the litigant before us. And we must therefore realize that we have to start doing something before it's become too late. People are started losing uh, you know, faith in the judicial system. People are taking law into their own hands. As, as we have been seeing, that police, for example, takes law in its own hands out of frustration and starts demolishing homes of people and shops as they did in Bombay yesterday. So, you know, these are things which are reflecting, you know, complete failure of the judicial system. And therefore, I think Justice Oka's uh, statements, uh, the entire speech is actually every lawyer and every judge must read that speech. He has said it so beautifully. He has, uh, you know, put it so, you know, nicely, yet very, very strongly. So I think uh, it's a beginning of a, a good, uh, I would say, development that a sitting judge has had, uh, has shown so much of courage. And I have no doubt that he spoke from his heart. Now, Justice D.Y. Chandrachud has completed over one year as the Chief Justice of India. And during this period, the Supreme Court has decided several uh, crucial issues which are, which are long pending, such as Article 370 matter, the same-sex marriage case. The electoral bond case was uh, heard and the decision is awaited. And C.J. D.Y. Chandrachud has also ushered in a lot of reforms also, particularly in the realm of e-courts. So how do you evaluate the term of uh, C.J. D.Y. Chandrachud so far? I think uh, with great respect to Justice Chandrachud, whom I personally hold very highly. Uh, he's been a friend in the past. I respect him as a judge. He's an intellectual. But having said all that, I must say he has been a complete failure. 
his one year has not achieved anything. In fact, when he took uh, oath of office, I wrote a very nice personal letter to him, uh, co congratulating him, complimenting him because he is really indeed very, very uh, bright. And uh, one had uh, hoped that he would do something, but he has done nothing. The changes that he's brought about are cosmetic changes. Those changes are really not doing anything in the justice delivery system. People are not getting justice. I was sitting yesterday in canteen when a very dear friend from Bombay, whom Justice Chandrachud also uh, knows personally, a senior lawyer, uh, was sitting across. And I asked him, what's happening in Delhi, Bombay High Court? He said, sir, nothing. It's at a standstill. There is no final hearing taking place. Matters are not getting listed. Matters are not getting heard. Uh, injunctions, once granted, are not getting vacated. It's a complete failure of the system, he said. Now, this I have been hearing from everybody. The other day, Gujarat senior lawyers came. They told me the same thing. So, in no court of India, today, final hearings are taking place. We are either deciding injunction applications or public interest litigations or, you know, bail matters as Supreme Court is doing or those applications for transfer of, you know, divorce cases from here to there, etc., etc. We needed structural reforms. And unless just Chief Justice... Any chief justice, you know, appoints a committee of stakeholders, judges, lawyers, uh, registry staff, you know, uh, 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 other stakeholders like uh, litigants, government and institutions like Indian Institute of Management and Indian Institute of Technology. These, you know, core group of about 20, 30 people should brainstorm, visit virtually many courts across the country, find out what the problems are, how we can overcome them. We are just not able to do that. Nobody is interested. I think Chief Justice is completely, I would say, uh, uh, proceeding in a wrong, uh, I would say, direction. If he thinks that sitting in Supreme Court uh, and deciding some SLPs, he is really doing a great job as the Chief Justice of India. No, with great respect, Chief Justice is also the first amongst all. And he has a responsibility to ensure that the judicial system is galvanized, it becomes vibrant, it is able to cater to the needs of people. There is a crying need of litigants that we are not getting justice. On that, I must say with utmost respects to Chief Justice Chandrachud that he has done precious little. But can we expect the Chief Justice of India to do, to do so much? Uh, so as to fix the situations at the high levels of high courts, because there are several high court judges. We have like over 500 high court judges across the country. And uh, can we, won't it be too much to expect uh, out of one individual to fix the entire no, high court? No, not at all. Not at all. Chief Justice will be constituting a core committee, which will also have representations from the high court. See, somebody has to take the initiative. No high court Chief Justice can take the initiative. It is only the Chief Justice of India who can take the initiative. And if he takes the initiative and finds out how to, you know, deal with the cases, because, you know, for example, there are a large number of cases in which government is involved. Government is the litigant, respondent, where, you know, government has uh, taken some decisions which are obviously wrong. We know how governments function. Now, how do you therefore, uh, you know, uh, prevail upon the government to really take actions which are not, you know, illegal per se? You start, you know, disposing of those cases, categorize them. Then you have cases like, for example, check bouncing. You know, you have to deal with those cases one way or the other. There is a law. You have now these cases of transfer of these. There are a large number of divorce petitions being filed, which is a sad commentary in our society on a social level. But having said that, those cases take, you know, three, four, five years for resolution. So you, Chief Justice, after getting a report of a committee like this, will you know, then brainstorm with his own judges across the country, visit high court to high court and talk to them as to how he can galvanize the system within the state. So it has to go from the top to the bottom. He has to talk to them unless he talks to, you know, Chief Justice is today inaccessible to uh, uh, every judge, be it a civil judge or a metropolitan magistrate or even a high court judge or even a Chief Justice, if I dare say so, of a high court. So Chief Justice... Uh, frankly, you must realize that government is not interested in ensuring that judiciary becomes more efficient and more powerful and justice is delivered because most of the injustices are at the hands of the government. 
So the government will not be interested. It is we as lawyers and judges who have to really take the initiative. Unless we take that initiative, and that can only be done at the level of the Chief Justice of India, because he has the power, he has the position, he has the status. He must be the leader of the institution to really take effective steps. Sitting here in Supreme Court and deciding matters, frankly, is not uh, the only role. Yes, that is an important role. But, I mean, look at the way Chief Justices are functioning. Every Chief Justice is deciding which matter will go to which bench. I mean, we know what's happening in the registry of the Supreme Court today. No matter can go without Chief Justice's consent. Now, is that what the role of a Chief Justice of India is? I mean, you have said that we will computerize the system. But computer doesn't work. It's the human hand which is working every day, day in and day out. And Chief Justice knows about it. So it's really, I mean, uh, this was not expected from Chief Justice Chandrachur. I mean, I could have understood some of his predecessors, I won't name them, who would, you know, indulge in that kind of a practice. But Chief Justice Chandrachur, everybody expected differently, although I had my reservations. And I said so in my, you know, uh, televised interview with Karan Thapar, even before his appointment, that I have serious misgivings about his approach. But having said that, because I know that he is a, he is a bright man, he is very intellectually good, and he, does, I mean, like him, like me, and like everybody else, he also loves judiciary. He also loves the administration of justice. But that love must translate into action, real action. Deciding SLPs and giving judgments in 370 is hardly the role that Chief Justice should perform. So recently you had written to the Chief Justice pointing out to certain uh, irregularities in the listing procedure. So you had complained in your uh, letter that certain sensitive cases are being allocated to certain benches in violation of the Supreme Court's own listing rules. And few few weeks later, the uh, Chief Justice, while speaking to a media, he said that, uh, seemingly responding to the complaints about registry, uh, he said that the listing of cases in Supreme Court cannot be lawyer driven and there is a rule and uh, it will go as per the rules and lawyers cannot pick and choose judges and all judges are equal. All judges of the Supreme Court are equal and you can't choose a judge for hearing a matter. So how do you respond to this uh, explanation given by the CJI? I can straight away say that Chief Justice was completely wrong. If I may say, so. I'm pained to hear those words from him. He uses a media platform instead of inviting us to discuss. Many of our, my colleagues, including Mr. Sibyl, sought appointments with him. I personally sought appointment with him. And he doesn't give us the appointment. He is totally wrong. We are not selecting benches. Our argument was that when benches have been selected by you, sir, and your registry, be it Justice Bopanna, be it Justice Call, be it Justice uh, Bose, be it any other judge, senior judge, those matters cannot then be transferred to a bench presided by a junior judge while those judges are sitting in the court. That's the, that's the rule. I don't think Chief Justice has ever read his own rules and handbook of procedure. With great respect to the Chief Justice, he was wrong when he made these statements uh, to Times of India. I saw that interview of Chief Justice. It pained me that Chief Justice does not have courage to talk to us, but talks to us through media. I mean, that was really not expected of the Chief Justice. Least I expected from him was courage to confront us personally and tell us in which case we would have pointed out to him that these are your rules, sir. These rules are being flouted by your registry. Please do something about it. I mean, I, I, I can tell you one case, for example, which was before a bench of Justice Bose and Justice uh, uh, Bela Trivedi, which was in respect of starting an investigation against the former Chief Minister of Tamil Nadu. The High Court took the view that because the government has changed, therefore you can't start investigation afresh. Now, this is completely wrong because Constitution Bench of Supreme Court has said that the new administration in political uh, new ministry has an obligation to look to the wrongdoings of the previous government. One. Two, criminal law clearly says that you can always go on investigating. I mean, we all see CBI files charge sheet after charge sheet after charge sheet. ED files charge sheet after charge sheet. Why? Because the investigation continues. Sometimes they may say there is no case, then they say, yes, there is a case. Now that case, Justice Bose, on the first day said this requires final hearing because High Court had decided against the state of Tamil Nadu. The, and he adjourned it twice on final hearing dates. 
to hear it finally. Then it is transferred to Justice Bela Tribedi's court. I pointed out to her that please, this is what Justice Bose had said, transfer it there. She said, let Chief Justice decide. Chief Justice decides and sends it back to Justice Bela Tribedi's bench and she dismisses it. Now, I'm sorry to say that what happened was completely wrong with great respect. It's, we are not talking about a judicial order. We are talking about Chief Justice's administrative powers. Chief Justice definitely, definitely did not use his administrative power wisely. So I, I don't think Chief Justice is right when he makes these statements. We are not seeking to choose benches. Trade convention says, I mean, I have been a lawyer for 46 years. Convention says, tradition says, practice says, and the rules say that the matter must continue with the senior judge. It is impossible in any high court, much less in Supreme Court, that matter would be transferred to a junior judge while senior judge is sitting in the court. So I think Chief Justice is complete. We are not trying to select the benches. I must tell the nation, we don't want to. When the matter is filed, the computer will decide who should, where the matter should go because Chief Justice has fixed the roster and he has assigned, has allocated the work. So let it be done. We are talking about cases where after matters were listed, the matters have been transferred illegally to other judges. Now, coming to the issue of judicial appointments. Now, off late, we saw a confrontation between the judiciary and the central government regarding the judicial appointments. And the central government has central government has been uh, acting in a brazen violation of Supreme Court's uh, judgments uh, that the reiterations are binding and there should not be any selective pick and choose from the collegium resolutions. But unfortunately, that is not happening. Uh, we see some resolutions are uh, approved very fast. Some are kept pending for years. So in this backdrop, how do you see the uh, collegium systems functioning? Look, I have always said that collegium system is disastrous. And time and again, collegium system has exposed itself. Time and again. Take, for example, recently, four Gujarat judges were ordered to be transferred. That order is not being implemented by the uh, uh, government. Yeah, today only Justice Trivedi was sworn in, in Gujarat as a, a judge, additional judge. His appointment was earlier you know, declined by the collegium. Then collegium reviewed it as per its own decision. Now that order after review, it goes to government, government immediately sends a notification, says appoint him and they appoint him. Fair enough. I have nothing against Justice Trivedi. He may be a great judge. I don't know him at all. I am on the collegium. How intellectually dishonest collegium is that its own you know, decisions which are taken long ago are not being implemented while some are selectively being implemented by the government and the collegium system is sitting twiddling its thumbs. It's wrong because government is in contempt and the judiciary led by Chief Justice of India and the collegium have no courage to hold up the government in contempt because it has been very categorically said that if our recommendations are made, you shall implement them. If we reiterate them, you shall appoint them. Now, these things is not happening. If it was an ordinary litigant, Supreme Court, like, you know, you saw that case of NCLAT, where Chief Justice suddenly, you know, sprung up into great uh, this thing and said, oh, call the members and, uh, you know, made them stand, including a retired judge of the high court. Nothing wrong was done that by them, frankly. And Chief Justice forgot that the appeal before NCLAT arose out of a judgment of NCLT where the member had sat on the order for over a year. He declared the order on 31st December of a particular year when it was a holiday. Next day, that judge retired. That order, which was challenged by a party before the NCLAT, was a completely dishonest order. Chief Justice should have seen that. Now, Chief Justice is willing to call judicial officers like this, but has no courage to call the government the Secretary, Ministry of Law and Justice to tell us that you will, we will send you in contempt if you don't implement our orders because that's the law under the judgment of the Supreme Court, constitution based judgment. So there is somewhere, I think, there is a, I would say, compromise between the collegium and the executive. So where the collegium recommends the executive doesn't like, the collegium sits silently quiet and enjoys, you know, the coffee and tea and meets and talks. 
and then it uh, makes recommendations uh, which government likes they are appointed next day i know of judges in supreme court who were pro government who called prime minister a hero whose file was cleared in less than 24 hours what does all this show this shows that collegium system is not you know functioning properly and judges of the collegium they are on administrative side have no courage to ensure that that decisions are their decisions are implemented as quickly as possible who is the sufferer the sufferer is the institution the administration of justice because good judges are not being appointed good judges are not being appointed and there are dozens and dozens of cases of outstanding judges who have been ignored and to the to the to the knowledge of the collegium i must say with great sense of pain that collegium has allowed these good judges to be destroyed. Many of them, Justice, uh, Chief Justice Akhil Qureshi, Chief Justice Murlidhar, uh, uh, Chief uh, Justice Patel from Gujarat. I mean, dozens and dozens of cases we know of. Why? Because the collegium is happy with some give and take. Now that's not, you did not grab power from the government in 1992 judgment to do this. You would grab that power with a promise to the nation that we will select the best from those amongst available. Are you selecting the best? Are you even seeing 15, 20 good judgments of judges whom you are appointing in Supreme Court? Are you seeing the conduct of lawyers who are being appointed in high courts or their background? Nothing. Frankly, nothing. Zero. I don't know what is the, what is the measure on which they are making the appointments. Sometimes I get dismayed at their appointments. And I have no doubt many I have talked to people in corridors across the country in courts. They are all shocked at certain appointments. We have great judges, but many judges who have been appointed are, are really questionable appointments, be it in Supreme Court, be it in high courts. And that is really something which uh, has caused immense, I would say, irreparable damage to the institution of judiciary. As a result of that inefficiency and to somewhat extent, Corruption charges are being leveled against judiciary, which is not good for us, which is not good. And when you have such good judges in collegium, why is this happening? Why don't they have the moral courage to stand up and say nothing doing? We are selecting the best. You shall appoint them, Mr. Government. No, that, that courage they don't have. The concept of secularism, I'm coming to that. So secularism has been declared to be a basic feature of our constitution by the Supreme Court itself. But of late, we are seeing a tendency of the divisions between the state and the religion getting blurred. And we are also witnessing increasing hate speeches and uh, crimes against minorities. We witnessed a very sorry episode of uh, an MP making hate speeches against minorities in the parliament itself. We also witnessed uh, a person with a history of hate speeches being elevated to the high court bench. And we are also seeing uh, targeted persecution of uh, persecution of minorities in the form of anti-conversion laws, bulldozer actions, against which Supreme Court did not take any action. So in this backdrop, what according to you is the future of Indian secularism? Well, you must realize one thing that judiciary across the country, including the Supreme Court, has become a major majoritarian judiciary. And as a result of that, the judiciary is unable to really strike at the wrongs which are committed in the society. And this does not reflect well on us. I mean, are the judges blind of high courts and Supreme Court when the police uses bulldozers to demolish homes and demolish uh, 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 shops and businesses? Are they, are they blind to it? I mean, yesterday, Supreme Court made observations in that Kheda case that where, where did the police have power to do what it did? Now, if that is so, why is it that the government, I mean, the judiciary remains silent? I mean, frankly, there is complete hypocrisy on the part of judiciary with greatest respects. You have to, you have to assert, you have to ensure rule of law prevails, irrespective of religion, irrespective of status, irrespective of caste, irrespective of anything. If judiciary is not able to do that, you see, you, you, are, you are seeding increasingly. On a daily basis, you are seeding turf to the executive. And as a result of that, 
executive is getting more and more and more emboldened. It has taken law in its own hands and citizens are suffering as a result of that. So there is no doubt that judiciary is today uh, is one of the weakest at weakest judiciary in the history of modern India. Even during the British Raj, judiciary was not as weak as it is today, I, I dare say. And today judges are just not willing to you know, confront these kind of violations, gross violations of human rights, so attacks on civil liberties, attacks on constitutional institutions. Nothing is being done by judges. I mean, uh, can you imagine uh, today a particular officer who is a, you know, a favorite of the government goes on getting extension in a highly important position again and again and judiciary justifies it at the highest level. Contrary to the rules, contrary to the settled practice, do they not realize that this officer is being only, you know, given extension to target the opposition? Is the judiciary not responsible for ensuring that democracy remains vibrant? It remains intact. If judiciary, you know, shuts his eyes and allows all this, you know, to go on, where will we end? The last hope was judiciary. But that, according to me, last hope is dashed by judges themselves. That is why I repeatedly say that look at Israel, where civil society stood up against Prime Minister Netanyahu's laws to say that judiciary will not have the last word. And by a judgment of eight is to seven, the Supreme Court of Israel said nothing doing. We have the final word. Now in a country where there is such a powerful prime minister and they said so when the war is going on against the Hamas. So, you know, you have to understand in Pakistan, when Chief Justice Iftakar Alam was removed, the judiciary struck back at a dictator, Musharraf, and said nothing doing. Reinstate him. The entire legal profession stood. In Kenya, when presidential election took place few years ago, the Kenyan Supreme Court said that the entire process was rigged and ordered a fresh election. In England, uh, when Boris Johnson did not call the House, the Supreme Court of England said nothing doing. You will call the House and put this resolution. Now, that's the kind of judiciary we expected our Supreme Court to be. These judges pride themselves saying, oh, we are great, great. No, you are not great any longer. You are not great because by your judgments, you are showing that you are timid. You are not able to withstand a strong, you know, executive. You must stand up. I'm not saying that every decision of executive is wrong. No, but you can't be seen to be approving every decision of the executive also. You have to test them. You are, unless there is that tension between the executive and the judiciary, democracy is gone. It's only on, you know, in the uh, in, in this book. It's not, it's not there in reality. So I think we really need to do something about. I really hope. I'm not sure whether Chief Justice Chandrachud will be able to provide that, uh, you know, uh, judiciary. But judges, those judges, because institution, you know, judiciary has some outstanding judges. In fact, more outstanding judges than judges who are not so great. And I hope and pray to them with folded hands, I beseech them that please stand up and give back to the executive where it is needed. Stand up for the citizens. Don't allow injustices to take place at the hands of the executive. I mean, can you imagine to take uh, destroy somebody's shop? If it is an illegal shop, as the government said yesterday in Maharashtra, I can show you millions of illegal shops in Delhi tomorrow. Are you willing to take action against them? No, there are hundreds of colonies in Delhi which are illegal. I see every day when I have, I have a farm at Kapasera where government lands are being occupied by, you know, illegally by people day in and day out. Nothing is being done. So why this selective targeting and why should judiciary be silent? So I, I don't know. I feel you are talking about secularism. I think uh, we have become a majoritarian nation. And I don't think secularism means anything at all, because if politics is now the way politics is, you know, you could not even uh, appeal to the voters in the name of religion. That's what the law is under Representation of People's Act. That's, that's how Supreme Court Constitution Bench has interpreted. Yet, 
in your 2014 and 2019 manifestos, Bharatiya Janata Party said, we will build the Ram Temple. And they have built it thanks to the Supreme Court. Only thanks to the Supreme Court. So, where is secularism? Which secularism you are talking about? We have become a Hindu nation. And I am really sorry, we didn't, didn't need to. We are a, I mean, Hinduism is a beautiful religion. I'm a proud Hindu. But as a nation, we are extremely, you know, homogeneous. We have multi, you know, multiple cultures. Our society for thousands of years has survived. I mean, besides Hinduism, Jainism came, Buddhism came, Islam came, Christianity came, uh, Zoroastrianism came. Every religion has thrived in this country. Sikhism came. They all have, you know, thrived in this country. We don't need to, you know, become suddenly, you know, great Hindus. It's not needed. Hinduism is about spirituality. It's not about this kind of... So, I, I personally feel that uh, the judges really should, uh, I mean, yes, it is basic structure of the constitution, secularism, but that's only on paper. I think we have ceased to have be a secular nation. And this debate which is going on in Supreme Court about Aligarh Muslim University tells us uh, what a, you know, what a difficult situation we have entered into. So before concluding, uh, do you have any final message to our uh, citizens and the judiciary also on the occasion of the Republic Day? Well, I, 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 I congratulate all of us citizens uh, on this beautiful independent, uh, Republic Day, which is coming up on 26 January. And uh, uh, we have all, it's a great nation. India is one of the great, I, I, I mean, I would always pray to God that in my next 100 lives, I should be born only in India. I love India so much. I mean, it is one nation which, uh, you know, is uh, an exceptional nation. I have traveled uh, many countries in the world, many, many countries in the world. But I would never want to live outside India because this is, uh, this is a country which is so throbbing. Uh, it's such a beautiful country with such a great, you know, history, great culture, great religions, you know, great, uh, you know, uh, life that we have, we, but the problem is that, you know, in this, in this kind of a republic, in this kind of democracy, you know, the benefits are only, have actually reached about 20, 30% people. If you are giving free food to 650 million people, as prime minister said the other day, then what does it show? that 650 million people out of 1400 million people are living below poverty line. Now, if you can't bring them out of poverty, the gap between the rich and the poor, we all see how the richest of this country, I don't need to name them, how they live. What kind of, they are, they are bigger than emperors of the Mughal era. Now, on, the, on this day, we have to therefore seriously introspect all of us as citizens. All of us love India. Everybody, whether those in uh, politics, those outside politics, those in film, those in business, those in legal profession, those on the bench, those who are practicing as lawyers. Everybody loves India. We all love India. Mother India is, you know, is so beautiful for us. So we have to introspect as to what can we really do to make this country stronger. It's sliding and it's sliding so rapidly that unless we all resolve that we don't want this slide, we want a democracy in true sense. We want respect for individual's dignity, human dignity in real sense, whether he's a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian or a Sikh or a Parsi, everybody must have the same respect for their dignities, whether it's a man or a woman, whether he's a Dalit or he's a Rajput or he's a Brahmin or he's rich or he's poor. Everybody must receive the same respect in the society from the state and from its institutions, including judiciary. That's where we really need to work how we can make our country more prosperous, more peaceful, where nothing but love really blooms. Everybody loves each other. This atmosphere of polarization, atmosphere of hatred has to stop. It's not going to do any good to us. And judiciary has a great role to play in that, to stop that further, you know, uh, erosion of that, you know, uh, uh, of that uh, society's, uh, you know, division. It's only judiciary which can stop. Politicians are politicians. 
they will do anything for their power because they want to perpetuate power. So let us resolve, I mean, citizens and my friends in the bar whom I all respect uh, and also those judges whom, uh, you know, who can really make a difference. Let us all pray together that we can make this country better and stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.